And now, <laughs> and now to the proper part, uh, for which we will switch to English. Um, we have um, three distinguished guests that will be um, talking about, well, Ludwig von Mises and Ludwig von Mises' role in the development of economic theory. Uh, I already had the pleasure of, pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Mahai yesterday, Professor Holtzman today. So I'm left with our third guest, um, Professor Josef Shima. Uh, Professor Shima, uh, I have also had the pleasure of meeting, I think, 11 years ago, and probably Professor Shima does not remember that, in, in, in a uh, week-long seminar in Bromov next to the Polish-Czech border. Uh, for which the Foundation of Economic Education, I think it was, the organizer of a week-long seminar on the, I think, basic principles of liberal economics, something of that sort, which was my first encounter with the broader international Austrian community. Uh, Professor Shima is the director of the Severo Institute, where you can um, get a PhD in Austrian economics. Masters at the moment. Masters PhD at the moment. is coming. PhD is coming. Masters already, PhD is coming. Um, he is an expert in law and economics um, and, the, um, and the connection between the um, public choice and Austrian traditions in economics. He is also the um, organizer of the Prague Conference in Political Economy and uh, the editor of the New Perspectives in Political Economy. Um, so um, basically, if you want to see more Austrians from around the world, I strongly recommend visiting Prague. I think it's uh, it's on spring, during spring, right? Are the PCPs? Yes. April. Yeah, and on spring, there's the PCP in Prague. Uh, very much recommended. Um, so let me now maybe perhaps move um, to sit with our distinguished guests. Um, so um, all of our guests have really, uh, I'd say, in-depth and, um, uh, dare I say, profound knowledge of the Austrian tradition and of Mises himself. So let me ask you for your first opening remarks and general thoughts when you hear the topic of the panel, which is Mises' role in the development of economic theory. And let's maybe start with Professor Holzman. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, first of all, I uh, should like uh, to, to start with an observation. I'm not sure whether you, uh, we made this today. Today is uh, September 29th. This happens to be Mises' birthday. So, it's happy birthday, accident. Mises. <laughs> it's not an accident. Yeah, it would have been the 107th, 108th, yeah, 107th birthday. Yeah. Uh, no, what well, 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 I'm talking, 137th, 137th, yeah. Um, well, there, there are, you know, to be, to be short and keep us uh, going quickly, I should like to stress in particular two points for which uh, Mises is, or three, three, three points for which Mises is famous in, in the history uh, of economic thought and important until the present day. The first one relates to his theory of money. Mises single-handedly rescued the classical theory of money from oblivion. Now the importance, I mean, as, as, as a background, it has to be said that the whole significance of classical economics lay in the fact that it reacted and revolted against what might be, uh, we might call today proto-Keynesianism. Right? We are today, of course, this is the dominant view on uh, macroeconomic uh, questions, and at, at the heart of this view lies the conviction that the spending of money, the exchange of money, is the driving force of the economy. So the more money people spend, the higher are the revenues of the market participants, so the, market, the other market participants then can spend themselves more money, so this creates revenue for other people, so this uh, spurs on the division of labor and so on. Uh, this is the basic idea. And if you look at Keynesian policies, they all revolve around this point. Right? Low interest policies, the management of expectations, right? government spending, debt finance spending, spending uh, financed by the printing press, and so on. It's all, all around this. Now, the, the crucial role of Adam Smith in the history of economic thought was that he articulated and first presented a cohesive and uh, overall uh, point of view in which the spending of money appeared to be completely irrelevant 
from an aggregate point of view. Adam Smith was not original in each of the individual points that he made, but as far as the overall theoretical framework is concerned, that was the, the classical revolution. For the first time, you had a group of intellectuals who could argue and did argue based on knowledge of economic mechanisms, contrary to uh, the philosophers of antiquity and medieval theologians who had the same conviction, but they, they didn't argue based on economic uh, mechanisms. So Adam Smith explained why it was the, the, the uh, causes of the wealth of nations are not spending of money, but to the contrary, uh, savings and the division of labor. The spending of money in the best of all cases, right, changes in aggregate spending or in aggregate demand, in the best of all cases could restructure the economy and usually they would uh, boil down to destroying capital, would boil down to capital cons uh, consumption. Okay, now this view for reasons that I don't have time to discuss now, but I, I'll be glad to, to uh, ask, uh, answer questions uh, if, you, if you have them, but by, and I explained this in several uh, publications, this view uh, receded into the background and the reason was the defective monetary theory of the classicals. So Adam Smith did not pay precisely because, because he came to the uh, insight that Ultimately, the spending of money is not a cause of wealth, therefore he relegated this. Uh, his followers, they were a little bit better. Jean Baptiste to say had a pretty good theory of money, same thing for Ricardo, but they all neglected the, the discussion of monetary mechanisms. And so it came that by the end of the 19th century, uh, the classical view had receded into the background and a new orthodoxy had emerged which revolved around the idea that the supply of money had to be flexibly adjusted to the variations of the demand for money. This is the view of the banking school, and this orthodoxy holds on till the present day. Now the significance of Mises is that he single-handedly completely demolished this theory and resuscitated the classical theory of Adam Smith and put it on sounder foundations and radicalized it. And the practical implications of this theory is uh, where so most notably there's uh, we, we shouldn't be overly concerned about the price level. The price level stabilization <coughs> of the price level is completely irrelevant from an overall point of view, and um, uh, the, the the spending of money is uh, is is not a driving force of uh, uh, of economic growth. So this is the first point. The second point uh, in the same book, right, in which he presented his theory of money in 1912 he made a decisive breakthrough in value theory, in value and price theory. He only hinted at this. He didn't develop it in these pages, but they are already there. And he takes this departure that I discussed in my, my lecture this afternoon, takes this uh, departure from, from Menger and uh, from Bumbabak. And these considerations then led him to his famous socialist calculation arguments. So this so is the second, uh, third major breakthrough, uh, which I also mentioned uh, this afternoon. And as a final point, I should like to mention that um, he also created a major breakthrough in economic epistemology because uh, he espoused the, the view that economic laws are a priori laws, so universal laws, but he had, a, as I also hinted at, right, he had a quite a sophisticated and nuanced um, uh, view of the place of universal causal relationships within the economy. So there he distinguished between universal unconditional uh, causal relationships and universal conditioned or con uh, conditioned by contingent uh, situations uh, and um, uh, explained how this related to the purely contingent causal relationships that are prominent in historical research. Now this is very abstract, I know, but I don't have time really to explain this. But if you're interested in this, I'll answer uh, any questions? Okay, I hand on the word to the next speaker. Professor Shima. Okay, um, let me make a few comments about not necessarily Mises' influence as such, but influences or direct Mises' influence, but the influence of Mises on economics and economic thinkers. Uh, not long ago after the fall of communism, Murray Rothbard gave a talk about the future of Austrian economics. And in that talk, he said that until recently, he said back in the early 90s, there were very few people developing Misesis or Misesian tradition. There were a couple of people remembering the old Austria, 
sometimes being placed as professors uh, far away from where the focus or the core of um, economic teaching was conducted, such as Ludwig Lachmann in South Africa. So those people from time to time arrived to the United States and sort of brought us a bit of the uh, old uh, Vienna's culture of studying economics. But the, the number of people was very limited. Uh, then something happened, uh, the revival of the Austrian school, and already in the early 90s, you not only had people who worked uh, not in isolation on topics which Professor Hilsman mentioned, such as the monetary theory, but moreover, you actually had disputes, internal disputes in the Austrian school. What exactly it means to be <coughs> in the shoes of the great Ludwig von Mises. And I believe this is, this is important element because exactly in those disputes, you can have scientific progress. And you can actually show better than as compared to the situation when you work in isolation, uh, you know, how you can apply Misesian understanding of economic phenomena onto, say, new modern economic development. And hence you had internal Austrian school debates about the essence of money and the banking system. Uh, and some people saw that as a way to uh, actually dehomogenize the Austrian school and show that you have a strictly speaking narrow Misesian line that goes, that started with Menger and through Bimbaverk and Mises continues today in the work of some, some scholars, modern scholars, uh, and that their understanding, for example, of money and the monetary system is the true Misesian tradition. There were others who said that actually there is a different, slightly or more divergent view about what it means to be Misesian today. But in any case, the debates over money and value theory and, and then applied topics such as the business cycle or the Austrian macroeconomics is something where the Austrians over the decades have contributed the most. Uh, but my point now is that you have uh, self-identified Misesians who work or continue developing those classical Austrian topics such as money, such as business cycles and others. Uh, moreover, you have a strong Misesian influence onto some people who do not self-identify as Austrians, but they acknowledge a very strong Misesian inspiration. One of those, for example, would be Gordon Tallock, one of the co-founders of the public choice theory. Uh, as Tallock himself said, that his interest in the study of politics, so in the study of uh, violent social interaction, uh, is coming from his repeated reading of Mises's human action. So here we have Gordon Tallock, who we would not pigeonhole as an Austrian economist, who says, well, I am inspired by, by Ludwig von Mises, and I just, I'm doing Misesian economics uh, in my own way, and hence a new branch of economics got born the public, public choice theory. And when you read, let's say, uh, James Buchanan, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, the second co-founder of, of public choice, his early works, such as his book Cost and Choice, you see indeed direct Misesian influence. And what is true for you know, public choicers is actually true for, for other scholars as well. Uh, you know, Vernon Smith, who received his Nobel Prize for Experimental Economics, said, well, I, I read Mises and Hayek, and then I thought I actually have a, a new idea about how to strengthen their point or their understanding of social relations, and he, he started Experimental Economics. 
So if you ask uh, you know, some self-identified Austrians whether they would consider Vernon Smith to be an Austrian economist, indeed, you know, they would say, no, no, that's uh, like a separate uh, school of thought, and there is plenty of differences on many levels between the Austrians, Misesians, and, and you, Vernon Smith. But when you <coughs> try to see Misesian influence onto economic theory, well, this is definitely a part of it. And the list of these kind of direct or sometimes indirect influences, what today would uh, be located outside of the Austrian school, continues indeed further to uh, institutionally oriented uh, lines of uh, economics. Uh, there is something which can be called Austrian law and economics. Uh, recently actually developed a lot, again, with first strong Misesian tradition being applied into or onto the field which is an intersection between law and economics, uh, which can stand on its own as a separate discipline actually, but also when you see similarities between other approaches of similarly institutionally or sort of cross-disciplinary approaches, you see an a Austrian and Misesian influence. Uh, so simply speaking, Ludwig von Mises was a great scholar who gave us uh, you know, deep understanding in the narrowly defined Austrian tradition but he, as a broad scholar of society, influenced a lot of people who built on him, maybe developed their theories in directions which Mises would never be sort of willing to take. But in any case, his influence survives in those areas as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shima. Dr. Mahai. Let me just add um, something uh, about the development of economics in general to all what has been said. Um, just a couple of sentences. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Nobel Prize in economics, but if you will look at last, let's say, last 10 winners, right, or last 10 years or a couple of years, you will see that we have uh, behavioral economics and rationality in, in uh, decision making. You have contributions to contract theory and theory of the firm. You have a uh, contribution to the analysis of poverty and welfare. You have um, contributions to theory of stable allocations and market design. You have theory of matching markets and frictions in markets. You also have uh, the analysis of economic governments and the boundaries of the, of the firm. Also the analysis of the um, efficiency of governing the commons. Now, so these are, uh, these are the developments that, that are actually discussed in some perhaps more rudimentary form, but still they are discussed uh, extensively in Mises' works. Now, I'm not saying that everything that has been written by those authors is either um, not, not original uh, or correct, right? Uh, um, it, can be <laughs> it can be original and incorrect. It can also be correct and original. But the point is that um, in Mises' works, you have those things discussed, and you can actually develop those things uh, along the lines of Mises' works. So that actually sh shows that uh, Mises is relevant not only inside the paradigm. So we started off by saying, like Professor Husman was, was telling you how relevant Mises is inside the paradigm. Then uh, Professor Shima told you how he is uh, relevant on the boundary of the paradigm. Now I would like to emphasize that he, he's even important like completely outside of the paradigm. Thank you. Um, so a question, and, and, and we had a bit of a quick catch up before the panel and, and we were talking about how we want to apply this, but I have a question I did not mention you then um, as a bit of a surprise. So if you, if you would um, want to think about what contributions of Mises, so you know, contributions to economic science are, are not only about being right and getting progress, sometimes you get into a dead end, you're wrong, but you still provoke some thinking around stuff. Do you see anything in Mises that A, you say, no, that is completely wrong and it's 
uh, but it spurred an interesting discussion. Or, um, yeah, he was kind of getting somewhere, but he didn't get it very right, and he gave, but he, but he opened the project for other people. Um, so basically about how pr was Mises productive, at, was Mises being productive at being wrong? And anybody wants to give it a shot, or should I call names? Right, if I may. Um, and I'm not sure whether that was not a topic in your previous uh, session in, in Polish, because that was about Mises and contemporary policies and European Union. Uh, but uh, I was struck when um, reading Mises' visions of uh, organiz political organization of Europe uh, in his papers from the th 30s and 40s, uh, which indeed was not a piece of economic theory. It was just his response to, to the horrible situation which has happened stemming from uh, you know, the, those ideas of uh, you know, nationalism and interventionism being brought to its ultimate uh, implications. Uh, and Mises at that time thought about how you can prevent all these horrible, devastating policies from taking place and how to save Europe. And he came up with these ideas about actually creating some sort of European Union of, of a sort with classical liberal constitution which would very strictly prohibit, limit the powers of national states to prohibit them from doing these devastating, uh, you know, horrible economically and, and, and you know, politi politically uh, policies. So he came up with this very strict uh, limitation or shift of the power from the level of national states to the level of the European uh, size political unity. In, in, and that was his vision how actually Europe can be uh, saved, which he himself realized how unrealistic it is. You, you do not really have a way how you can do it. Uh, but you know, he, the man who knew about the night dynamism of interventionism and all the rest of it, how, what sort of dangers one can create by actually shifting power towards some higher political unity, he, with all his knowledge, actually saw it as the last uh, you know, possible solution to the, to the how to stop policies which devastated Europe. Uh, so I don't know whether he was wrong in a sort of strong sense, but it's definitely is, a, is an illustration of a situation, you know, what a theoretician can uh, come up with when trying to solve practical political issues at a given very difficult political situation. So it's very instructive to read it and it actually can bring a different flavor to contemporary debates about the nature of political European, uh, let's say, cent centralization. Thank you, Professor Shima. Anybody else on some, uh, something where Mises was wrong? Well, I mean, uh, in, in many of my own uh, economic research, so not history of economic, I've, I've tried to uh, improve those elements that appear to me to be the most, uh, uh, the, the weakest elements in, in Mises' uh, uh, system. F uh, one example would be equilibrium theory. Right? So I think that Mises by and large had it right, but because he, he saw that the, the role of equilibrium constructions in economic reasoning is very limited. Right? It concerns very, uh, very precise uh, uh, explanations that we want to give of the difference between profits on the one hand and interest on the other hand in particular, and then factor pricing uh, related uh, kind of question pertaining to factor pricing. So this, I think, is a very, uh, in, is a crucial insight. 
Um, so, but the, the weakness of his construction was the particular type of, uh, the particular way we, uh, he envisioned economic equilibrium. So he uh, proposed to use an artificial intellectual construction that he called the evening rotating economy. And my argument was that we didn't need this form of fictitious reasoning. We could make economic reasoning more uh, realistic by uh, relying on the uh, counterfactual distinction between uh, success and failure, so that the equilibrium uh, construct should be s seen in, in the context not as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a construct, but as a particular type of economic analysis, namely equilibrium analysis, so the systematic comparison between situations of success and failure. Again, this is rather uh, abstract. I just mentioned this here in passing. Right? I have a very long article for those who of you who are interested in this, more than 50 pages. Uh, with, with the title toward um, realist approach to thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had to read it uh, I forced him okay, thank you hi any thoughts no not really I would agree that in terms of pure theory theory of interest and theory of equilibrium is where you can find some major inconsistencies hmm. in, in Mises and that would be it with economic policy analysis and uh, Judgments about I mean, this is what we know so far, right? right. Yeah. Ah, right, right, yeah. right. We can still find some flaws, right? But, but yeah. so, so much time has been devoted to, to, to doing this that mm. I guess that this is what stands out, definitely, right? Yeah. There are some major, like, yeah, I would say that sometimes, even though Mises is uh, against neoclassicism, sometimes he, yeah, but this is pretty obscure. No, I'm not saying this. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say that uh, at some points in his works, he, um, when he discusses marginal costs and pricing, uh, at times he, because he, did, he didn't really develop production theory like Rothbard did, so at some points he makes concessions by, by saying that neoclassicism is sort of correct in saying that only marginal costs matter for present day pricing. I disagree with that because I think that even fixed cost can be forward looking when you, when you assess the current value of factors, right? But that's just a little bit obscure. So. Okay, thank you. So now that we spoke a bit in places where we think Mises perhaps was a bit slightly not exactly there, um, I'm wondering about the opposite situation, right? And I guess Professor Shima is the closest one to kind of touch on what I want to ask about now is, do you see any places where either um, like that, that old, I think it was a Gandhi quote, right? That face, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight with you, and then they treat you as it was always true, or so they, they agree with you. So is there anything where you would see that, A, the, the mainstream has became Misesian, but they just don't say it, and something that changed over the, in the history of thought, or alternatively, where Mises anticipated something <laughs> that was not really accepted until later on somebody rediscovered the same point? So basically, is there Mises in the mainstream through any of those routes? Let me start briefly. I, uh, I wrote a book on Austrian law and economics, and I have a chapter there about uh, Mises actually touching and developing concepts which then, after 20 or 30 years, were uh, brought to textbooks and mainstream exposition by others without actually mentioning Mises or, or Rothbard for that matter. Um, typically, Alci and Demzets and economics of property rights coming up with uh, you know, insights which were in its nature Misesians uh, and kind of commonly used by, by previous Austrian scholars uh, without uh, actually you know, being uh, un understood or being made, without being uh, like exposed uh, as a part of economic theory to, to students. Uh, same with uh, Mises' analysis of the commons uh, and all the problems which property held in commons brings about. Mises has a sort of comprehensive theory with all uh, subsequent um, sort of uh, implications, but at the same time, when today you read, you know, who who is the the author remembered for understanding the commons problems? It's it's Mises gets never mentioned. 
uh, and I'm sure there will be other, other things as well, because Austrians from the very beginning work on this broad nexus of law and economics, property-based e economics, or explanation of two pro simultaneous processes, generation of prosperity on the one hand and elimination of conflicts on the other hand, which the rest of economic profession for some time forgot about and then costly uh, you know, brought these ideas back in, let's say, the 60s and later on. <coughs> Yeah, two more uh, basic examples would be the, uh, Mises' theory of socialism, to which many people rallied in, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, when, when it was obvious that uh, socialist, real life socialism was, was a failure, so then suddenly many people rediscovered Mises' arguments. And then uh, the typical point of view when, when people, even professional economists, uh, discover and rediscover Mises' arguments is uh, after the next uh, financial crisis. So then they remember that there was something like the Austrian business cycle theory, uh, that, that uh, uh, expansionary monetary policy designed to ease credit conditions, whether under the form of uh, lower interest rates or uh, lower collateral requirements and, and so on and so on, uh, entails uh, uh, adverse consequences uh, for, for the real economy, finally. And uh, this also right, is, is rediscovered again and again. So the Austrian theory will, just for this for this reason, will always become, will always remain uh, in, in the conscience of uh, uh, non-Austrian economists. Right, and, and uh, to make that point even broader, uh, after the crisis, uh, especially after the 2008, cri uh, 2008 crisis, there were many macroeconomists from the mainstream started to question the idea that monetary policy should be aimed at the particular price level just. Uh, that is the only variable that matters, just the price level. Uh, um, Mishkin, Friedrich Mishkin, very relevant thinker uh, that deals with monetary policy, had a great timing, quote unquote, and when he, in 2007, just before the crisis, he released a paper, uh, was the title was, I think, should central bank pay any attention to asset prices? And the conclusion was no, not really, because what matters is just the final price level, uh, great timing. So, uh, but then after that, uh, many economists started to notice that, you know, perhaps, uh, yeah, well, from understanding the, the causality, the, the mistake is caused by the central bank, uh, to, to actually noticing that there is, of course, a big role, right? But, but noticing uh, and acknowledging the fact that perhaps not only the final price level matters, it's already some, some step forward, right? That you understand that not only final prices matter, but also other prices matter. Also, after 2008, or, or general, in the last 20 years, I think that in the so-called so uh, yeah, mainstream literature, I think that uh, Apple pleas for reasonable phobia, right, the fear of deflation is somehow smaller, right? Uh, we still have economists thinking that if you have deflation, that this is some gangrene or something, right? But, uh, um, but, but I guess that somehow there is I would guess there is more sympathy towards deflation, that it has to be, that doesn't have to be destruction, right? It doesn't have to destroy the economy. Even in, in the famous uh, statement by Bernanke, was it in 2002, I think, or 2004, deflation making sure it does not happen here, even in there you will find like two sentences in which he says, you know, where there is price deflation caused by technological progress, like in computer industry, it's not really a problem. It could really work when you have falling costs and falling final prices, right? So I would say that, uh, that, that this is something, of course, indirectly acknowledging that Mises was right. Hayek was writing more about this, but, but in general, I think he got it from, from Mises. Thank you. Um, so for my final question, before we open to the audience for, for, for questions, <laughs> Um, although I will also give you a chance if you, if you would like for any closing remarks if anything went through your head throughout the discussion. Uh, for my final question, um, so is, is Mises still relevant in the sense, do we, do we need to read Mises today? So for example, what you said about, um, about how Rothbard was um, a bit more comprehensive in production theory, right? Um, and, and a lot of claim that, hey, man, economy and state is the easier to read version of human action. So do we still need to read Mises today or is everything already um, repackaged or done better by the, uh, his apprentices? 
Well, we, in economics, we have a very particular situation because, first of all, by its very nature, uh, economics is not a cumulative um, uh, science or, let's say, not, not a path sequential science as in the natural sciences. Right? In natural sciences, you have certain questions of principle, you have a paradigm, and it remains for a very long time, and there are always additional problems. In economics and the social sciences, we, by and large, we always discuss the same questions, the same basic uh, mechanisms under different uh, disguises. Right? So ultimately, it comes all, always down to, to basic mechanisms. Then, uh, uh, this uh, needs to be seen uh, conjointly with the fact that we have in economics the longest orthodoxy that we ever had, right? especially in macroeconomics, but in microeconomics also to some extent. In, micro, in uh, the first two years of the university, university training, wh whatever the country, I suppose in Poland it's not much different than in, in France or in the US, Germany, it's all, uh, always the same, so we teach microeconomic models and macroeconomic models that have been developed in the 1920s and in the 1930s. That's a fact. I mean, most students maybe not, don't know this, but I can assure you it's, there's virtually no deviation. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the longest orthodoxy that we ever had. And it's especially ironic in macroeconomics because Keynes was mocking and combating what he called the orthodox economists. The irony is that he himself instigated the longest orthodoxy that we ever had. I mean, Adam, Smith, Adam Smith's doctrine didn't survive the 19th century unscathed, and neither did John Baptiste Say and, and, and David Ricardo. It's never happened before. Now, so the funny thing is that because uh, the economics profession uh, cultivates this incredible conservatism that the theories that attack the very principles and propose a radically different approach and different model have remained as actual, as current, as relevant as in the day of, of the first publication. So ironically, it's precisely because we have this monolithic way of teaching uh, economics in the mainstream that the Austrians, and in particular Mises, have remained as relevant as they had been on the first day. And Mises, in particular, is uh, a most precious source. I mean, I don't want to denigrate uh, the, the importance of man, economy, and state, which is indeed a, a, a wonderful book to learn economics, and I use it for my students uh, as well. Uh, but it does not reach the same depths that we find in human action and in uh, the, the other books uh, for, for which Mises is, is famous. So Mises still has a lot to offer even for very experienced, very advanced uh, students and for professors. Uh, at the Mises Institute in the United States, we have each year uh, a graduate seminar, uh, the, what we call the Roth uh, Rothbard Graduate Seminar. Uh, and each time we, we turn to the text uh, Human Action, we discuss this uh, during one week, uh, all of the professors, who, sometimes who have read the text 10, ten times, they, uh, they always learn something new. There's always something, there are many things that you only comprehend once yourself are sufficiently far advanced. Because there, there are problems that he talks about and he's, he's so clear and it, it sounds so, so easy, it flows by itself, but you don't see really the problem. You don't see the depth that he has reached. reached. You see it only when yourself are in a position to understand the problem. Very often you don't see the problem. So it is a great text. It's still a most precious uh, deep source and yeah. It will so remain so for a while. I don't see any major revolution coming that would make it completely irrelevant. This is a follow-up question for maybe before we go on. Do you have like, any specific example in your head of somewhere where you're thinking like Mises was so much deeper on this topic than Rothbard? Oh, it's it's uh, it's often it's um, it's small questions. For example, if you think just um, uh, the things that are, that I mentioned before, right? That uh, the these uh, epistemological questions, how do the different causes interact with one another? They are universal causes that are unconditional. They are universal causes that are conditional. They are contingent causes, okay, that come into a place. There is a, a, a form of inquiry that we call history because it's concerned only with contingent causes and it brings into play the necess necessity of a subjective judgment because we have no way of disentangling because, because it's not a universal, right? So we need to uh, to judge the relative impact of this and that factor on a concrete uh, situation. Right? So these things that, that Mises brings into, into focus that you do not fully understand the first time you read it. Right? And then eventually you come to see, well, what's the connection with this pricing theory? What's the connection for the epistemological, uh, epistemology of the social sciences? Eventually you get to that to the point. But there are many small uh, points where he uh, 
I don't have any precise example now. We have to, to read, I mean, probably you can read just any five pages in, in human action you would find. I could name you such a, such a point. If you give me a little time, I'll look it up. Hey, thank you. Any thoughts on the topic of the relevance of Mises and why should you grab it if you can grab the apprentices or the next generations of Austrians? Well, I, I have a smaller point than Professor Hilsman. Um, you know, when I uh, teach economics in, in the PPE program I run in Prague, we typically read uh, economists, uh, like the original articles or chapters from books, r rather than like modern textbooks. And what I found really instructive is to read Mises on the one side and then other economists of, of his time about particular topics, you know, be it money, be it, you know, rationality of uh, socialist planning and so on. And, and then you realize, you know, how, how, how deep uh, his understanding was when you compare it to like the best minds in the profession back then uh, thought about the issues. And now, you know, now we often know the consequences, uh, typically when it comes to, you know, po policy issues, so destructive policies. And, and w once we understand how Mises, using his theory, how he could understand the issues without indeed knowing, the, the, you know, not being able to see in, into the future, how, how clear he was in the 20s or 30s or later on, as opposed to the semi-blind, allegedly famous economist of his time, you then understand much better contemporary issues because all the old fallacies are coming back often, all the economic myths are at some point repeated once again and, and you can benefit from actually um, you know, understanding better how come that M Mises was able to see what other people were not able to see. Thank okay, you. give you another I, one example has come to my mind, recent example. So I was, I was doing research uh, on, uh, doing a lot of stuff right now on f financial phenomena, liquidity, uh, risk and so on, so I was writing a, a, a paper on, uh, on the risk premium. And I've come to the conclusion that the risk premium actually doesn't exist. Okay, so it's an optical illusion that comes from the fact that we have entrepreneurs who t subjectively assess risk in a, in a different way, so you, uh, different assets are evaluated in a different way. Okay, to make it short. And I don't go for, for, for the full argument. Uh, so the, the point is, I thought, wow, I mean, this was very happy about the, uh, the conclusion. I said, yeah, this is based on uh, Mises' distinction between class probability and case probability. And then eventually I come to read this one passage in, his, um, in Human Action where he says, well, the entrepreneur doesn't diversify. Right? It doesn't diversify. It's, uh, he, the entrepreneur always tries to uh, uh, obtain or uh, to realize the product where he, obtains, where he expects to earn most money. And I realized that the guy had just he had completely anticipated what I thought was my original contribution. It's exactly the same point. I mean, now in a, in a different way. So, but I had read this before, right? But I was incapable of making the, the connection. For him, it was clear, well, the entrepreneur uh, doesn't discount uh, something like, uh, what he says, risk. And, okay, then I'm discounting this. I think, oh, investing in the, in the Congo is a little risky, so I will invest there only if I get 10% uh, extra or something like this. And he said, this is complete nonsense. I mean, this, people who do this are not entrepreneurs, they are gamblers. If you're an entrepreneur, you're convinced that by going and investing in the Congo, you will make money. Otherwise, you're just gambling. And you go to the Congo, well, you, you're convinced that you make money. You might be wrong. That's a different uh, story. But you are convinced that you make money. And so if we own different, at the end of the, after 10 years or 15 years of being an entrepreneur, we own different stuff, it's not because we want to diversify risk. It's because in this context, this project was most promising. Uh, two years later, there was another project that was most uh, promising. And so we have different things in which we are involved, which is simply the cumulative result after so many years of investing in what are the, the greatest opportunities. That's what an entrepreneur does. And it's a complete wrong vision which is unfortunately taught in all our business schools, especially in the finance departments, that we conceive of 
uh, risk as something like a uh, like an anti something that really exists and that we somehow deduct from 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 profit and then try to diversify things. So this is this is as Mises would probably have said. This is the perspective of a subordinate clerk <laughs> in a casino. <laughs> yeah. So what the point is, right? Is I've come to understand him only once I was myself in a position to see the point because I overlooked it before. Okay. So let's give a warm thank you to our speakers and thank you so much.